Hi there. What you see in front of you here is a drawn data set. Uh, I have two classes drawn over here. Uh, and in this video, I'm going to be making a relatively simple classification pipeline. Uh, and I want to emphasize that this is a relatively easy problem. We've got a very clear class over here and another clear one over here. So this can be seen as a relatively easy task. We just have to separate these two classes that are easily separatable. However, as we'll see in a bit, uh, depending on some properties of the drawn points over here, there may actually be a little bit of nuance that goes beyond being able to separate these two classes. And that's related to the scale of the numbers, so to say. In particular, we're going to discuss uh, scalars inside of scikit-learn, which are pre-processing steps for a machine learning pipeline. And what I hope to get across in this video is that the scalars actually have some interesting properties that do go a bit beyond the standard accuracy metrics that you might already be used to. So back to that data set, um, I drew it and I've made a matplotlib chart over here and it definitely has this shape, it looks like this. But for the illustrative purposes of this video, I did make one somewhat cheeky change and that is reflected on the x-axis over here. What I've effectively done is I've said, well, let's just multiply the x-axis here with a very big number. So you can see that uh, the numbers here are definitely way bigger than the numbers over here. And again, we're not doing something over the top crazy. Uh, there are definitely bigger numbers that I could put in here. But the thought experiment that you can start playing with is, gee, if there's an imbalance between these two axes, um, how might a machine learning algorithm respond? To help explain that, uh, I will be using a k nearest neighbor algorithm. In particular, I'm going to use a classifier. And the thinking behind this algorithm is that suppose that I've got a point, uh, let's say over here, then it's going to look at the nearest, let's say five neighbors, which are presumably these points. And then depending on the class of those neighbors, it's going to make a prediction. In this case, all five of the neighbors are orange. So this point will be predicted as orange. But you can imagine maybe something here in the middle where uh, these two are the closest on this side, and maybe there's three over here. Uh, my drawing is not necessarily going to be perfect, but just to illustrate the point, uh, there are points in the middle here somewhere where uh, a fraction of the neighbors are of one class. So this approach of classifying is also able to predict the uh, probability values, let's say. So I might have a three out of five probability of being blue if uh, I'm drawing a point somewhere over here. All of this is well and good, but let's now maybe try to draw uh, what this looks like. Because as you might already start feeling, uh, this axis is going to play a pretty big role in the predictions that are going to come out. So uh, let's demo that. Um, I have a pipeline here with just a machine learning model. That pipeline is going to receive the data that I drew. There's a little bit of code for that over here. Uh, again, you can see I've got my pipeline. It really only has one component. And then when I look at the predictions, it looks a little bit something like this. Um, the way that I've made this chart, by the way, is I'm asking the model uh, to make many predictions and I'm just giving it random points. And this is a kind of a quick and dirty way to get an impression of the landscape and the predictions that are being made. So you can definitely see uh, we've got a blue section over here where all the points are blue. Uh, and we've got an orange section over here where all the points are orange. Now the algorithm does a good job. Uh, we are separating both of these two clusters. So the algorithm is doing fine. But you can wonder, well, it seems that this decision is really only being made on one axis over here. It's really just a decision on the x value. And this y value barely seems to be contributing anything. And depending on the use case, that might not exactly be what you want. There is something to be said that you maybe want to have a separating line that's just a little bit more around here, something between the two clusters. And hopefully, you look at this behavior and you also kind of go, well, it's also not the biggest surprise. Uh, after all, if we're going to be calculating distance between points, then clearly this axis will have a number that just dwarfs whatever distance is going to be contributed by this axis. So this might be one situation where you might want to scale the data points just so you can get a decision boundary, so to say, that has a slightly different shape. There are also other reasons why you might want to scale your data. There can be numerical aspects to your algorithm. But let's now just discuss uh, a couple of ways on how you might want to go about scaling this data, because there are uh, a couple of choices that you could be making here. 
So to help explain what you might be able to do with scaling inside a scikit-learn, I figured I would just demonstrate three options. Uh, these aren't all the options out there, uh, but let's go over the standard scalar, the min-max scalar, and the uh, quantile transformer. These are all um, relatively popular methods for scaling. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm just uh, using the component in question as if it was in a scikit-learn pipeline, so I'm just calling fit transform on it, uh, just so I get the representation of the transform data, uh, and then I'm plotting that below. So for now, uh, I'm just looking at the standard scalar. Uh, we're gonna check the other methods uh, afterwards as well. But if we just uh, look at this, we can already see a couple of differences. This is the original data. Again, note the uh, huge x-axis over here. Uh, and this is the uh, transformed data, so to say. Uh, when you're just eyeballing this, you'll notice that a lot of it really just looks the same. It's mainly the axes over here that uh, seem different when you're just looking at this. Now, the way that this works effectively for the standard scalar is that when the algorithm is fitting, it is looking at each of these axes separately. And then it's figuring out the mean and the standard deviation on each of them. So for example, uh, on this axis over here, um, you can imagine that the mean would be around here. The average would probably be around 250, something like that. But besides calculating the mean, we are also calculating the spread. Now, to be specific, we're interested in a standard deviation, which is basically the average of the distance from each point to this center over here. And once you have both, there's just this convenient statistical formula where you can say for every data point, I that I've got, um, subtract from that the mean that I've seen in my data set, divide by the standard deviation, which again is this uh, distance, and that'll allow me to map each point that I've got on the left into a point that I've got on the right. And the typical effect that you would have is mainly that the data becomes centered. We can see here, for example, that we have uh, the zero axes over here. So we've got a center of that axis, but also that all the Variance is then translated into number of standard deviations. So this axis has two standard deviations-ish on that side and maybe about two on that side. But hopefully this paints a picture of how we're able to take an axis and turn it into something that's a bit more standard, so to say. And we don't just do that for the y-axis, we also do that for the x-axis. And as a result, uh, one thing that's happening under the hood is that these distances also get kind of normalized. A distance on the x-axis over here is definitely more comparable to the y-axis than in this situation where we're dealing with these, I will call, over-the-top large numbers. Now there are also some other ways to do this. Um, you don't necessarily have to use the uh, standard deviation and mean. You can also use the minimum and maximum. Now again, uh, the shapes of these blobs uh, don't seem that different. The main thing that's really changed are these axes. In this case though, uh, the way that we're scaling is we're really just looking at each axis and we're looking at the minimum value and the maximum value. And we're gonna rescale that such that in this uh, new transformed representation, um, we scale everything between zero and one. This has a somewhat similar effect to what we saw earlier. Uh, again, we get two axes that we can compare. But hopefully you can also feel that you have to be a little bit careful here, and that's because of the effect that outliers might have. This drawn data set over here doesn't have a huge outlier in it, but you can imagine that the presence of one uh, can also skew the representation. One way to maybe deal with that is to consider using the quantile transformer. And because I'm dealing with a small uh, data set here, I will have to uh, set the number of quantiles to 100 in order not to get an error message. But the quantile transformer also, again, does kind of a similar thing, but it cuts everything up in quantiles. Now, the way that this quantile transformer works is we're going to introduce buckets, but the buckets are going to be introduced based on the distribution of the data. So let's say we start at the top over here. Then I'm going to keep on building a bucket until I've got, let's say, 1% of the data then all the data points that fall into that bandwidth go and uh, fall into that bucket. And I have a similar bucket over here, uh, that's maybe 2%. Um, these buckets can be thinner or thicker depending on how much data actually falls in. 
But the gist of it is that we will end up with 100 buckets of different sizes. But if you have 100 buckets, each bucket should have approximately 1% uh, of the data going in. We do that for both of these axes. And by doing this, we see that the transform data actually is visibly different. In particular, there's just no gap in the middle over here. And the reason for that is simply because there is no data point over here. In particular, on the axis that I have down below here, uh, there's this bandwidth where there's basically no data. So that would also mean that all the buckets that I'm allocating here would be kind of on the side of that. So if I were to draw this a little bit more neatly, uh, there probably would just be one big bucket in the middle over here on this one axis, which is also kind of why uh, the wide gap that we've got over here uh, barely shows over here. Another thing to keep in mind is that if this original data set has very solid outliers, then in this data set, uh, that would be more squished. It's for the same reason as before. We again would have this one slither of a bucket for the 1%, so to say. And even if it takes a while before we hit our uh, next 1% bucket, uh, the way that this gets projected is these will just get squished together uh, on the right-hand side here. So just to mention, scikit-learn definitely has more options than the ones that I'm showing over here. But the main thing for now is just to point out that there is definitely more than one flavor on how to scale your data. And I guess like the final thing that I would like to show with that topic is just also show you what the effect is on the predictions. So kind of as a final demo, uh, what I figured would be fun to do is to remake the chart that we started with, uh, that is this one, where you can really clearly see that there's uh, one direction at which the decision is being made. And what I can do is I can make the same chart, but when the data is scaled. So what you're looking at here is basically the same prediction, but in a pipeline where we are using a standard scaler. And you can see that that smooth line that I was alluding to earlier, that's actually happening here. And I think this is pretty interesting because in this case, you can see how scaling the data kind of pushes the algorithm to consider both of these axes, even if one of the, even if one of them has like a way bigger scale. And I can imagine there being some applications where you might want that. Another thing that's kind of interesting in this particular case, uh, we can also show what it looks like if we use a different uh, transformer. So let's go for the min-max scaler now and just uh, rerun it. Now, it's a subtle difference, but before we had a line that was just kind of more smooth, and in this case, we kind of have a line that's more straight. And if we were to go for the quantile transformer, uh, then we get this shape. Now, there's a few reasons why we see this shape. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that these aren't necessarily big data sets, so uh, a few extra points to the left or to the right can actually uh, make a somewhat larger shape change. But again, what we see reflected is the fact that in the middle over here, there's barely any data points. And that is why when we move in this direction, uh, there is effectively no change in the decision. The moment that we start hitting data points again, uh, then the line becomes smooth once more. But there's really no data in the middle here, and that's why we see this uh, somewhat jump. So there you have it. Uh, these are methods that you can use to scale your uh, axes, so to say, and there are moments when this can be useful. Now, one thing to keep in mind is, again, that uh, if you're interested in the shape of the prediction going out, that might be useful. But if you're really just interested in the right prediction, technically, the k nearest neighbor algorithm was doing its job well here. And there certainly are algorithms that don't necessarily require scaled data in order to function. Uh, Tree-based models definitely come to mind. But there are algorithms that do appreciate when there's scaling happening just for numerical reasons. So I hope that this was a nice demo of uh, what you can do with a scaler. But uh, for the next episode, just to give a bit of a preview, I kind of want to dive deeper into this standard scaler over here. Because after this demo, you might think, well, this standard scaler is nice, but it seems relatively straightforward and it probably has a straightforward implementation as well. And that's actually not 100% true. There's actually a couple of non-standard things happening in the standard scaler. And that is something I would like to discuss in the next video.